Hello, my name is Tony. Someone calling themselves Tector Gorch, while Bunch fans will figure it's an alias most likely, flipped the switch on this one. Despite it hitting screens in 1997, it has a very early 70s grindhouse sort of feel, but with far higher production values and a much slicker edifice. And it's a great little number. If it had been written and directed by Tarantino, no doubt sycophantic acolytes of the big Q would have proclaimed it a towering masterwork by an innovative cinematic genius as it wasn't one of his and was way too quick to spiral into obscurity it didn't attract any such accolades so i'm going to do my bit to try and reignite some interest in this criminally neglected neo-noir modern classic the narrative runs like this Retired thief and career criminal Roy Egan, Harvey Keitel, is persuaded to join his younger brother Lee, Timothy Hutton, and his partners in crime Jorge Montana, Wade Dominguez, and wheelman Skip Kovich, Stephen Dorff, on a jewel heist in Palm Springs. Roy is a tight-lipped, taciturn, and measured professional crook. Since the haul is likely to net about $3 million and is straightforward enough, quick in and out, three minutes, sounds like my sex life, Roy is content to do his younger brother brother a favour. Jorge is married to Rachel Famke Jansen, and they have two young boys. He's facing a court case and jail time, so needs a big score to take care of his family whilst he's inside. Skip, however, is a volatile, disturbing and unpredictable wildcard, owing large sums of money to the loan shark Harvey Elliot Gould, who has ties to the Chinese mob in LA. He's shacked up with a young airhead, Gina, Dana Barron. It's his job to source the guns for the heist from gang leader O. Dell Michael Jai White and drive the getaway vehicle. The heist goes down successfully, executed with brutal efficiency, and the four get away clean with the diamonds. Whilst calculating what the haul is worth at the trailer park they've made their base, Hothead Skip shoots both Lee and Jorge dead. Roy manages to escape from the trailer and plunges into a nearby lake. Having drawn attention from other residents in the park, some of whom are armed, Skip sets fire to the trailer, incinerating the bodies of Lee and Jorge, and then heads up with the gems. Emerging on the opposite side of the lake and into a storm drain, Roy makes it back to his motel room. Now he is determined to find and kill Skip and salvage the plunder. Taking Odell and his crew along for protection on the promise of a payout, Skip meets with Harvey. He makes a deal to repay his debt with an additional 20k if Harvey will consent to send his Chinese mob partners after Roy. Anyone getting the feeling this is not going to end well won't be disappointed. Roy goes to Jorge's home and informs Rachel of her husband's murder. He tries to get information from her on where Skip might be, but grieving and angry, she throws him out. Two Chinese hoods ambush and assault Roy, whilst taking him to the docks by car, Roy stabs one in the throat with a pen and strangles the driver until the car crashes. The next morning, Rachel finds him bloody and unconscious on her lawn. She takes him in, stitches him up, and cleans his wounds. She gives Roy Jorge's address book with clues to where Skip hangs out on the proviso that Roy will give her $100,000 of the heist proceeds. Furthermore, she points him towards where the Chinese mob fence goods and launders cash. She gives him a St. Christopher medallion for protection. I think a fucking chain gun would have been a better option, but maybe that's just me. Roy confronts Uncle Luke, Francois Chow, the boss of the money laundering operation, and beats and threatens him until he gives him all of Skip's cash from the fence in of the diamonds. Roy accidentally drops his motel cabin key in the scuffle, and Uncle Luke passes the information of his whereabouts to Skip. Three Chinese hoods turn up at Roy's cabin, but he shoots one and the others are wiped out when a bullet hits a gas canister, causing a massive explosion and destroying Roy's rented cabin. Roy has taken a bullet in the shoulder. Meanwhile, Skip has kidnapped Rachel and demands Roy bring his money to a refinery to trade it for her life. There's a trailer he uses as a bolt hole. When he arrives though, two of Odell's men are in situ and are holding Gina hostage because Skip has neglected to pay them for their services as promised. Skip shoots the two men and Gina into the bargain. When Roy turns up, he is met by more Chinese mobsters. He gets the drop on them, killing two before a third shoots and seriously wounds him. Skip emerges from the trailer and blasts the remaining Chinese hood before frantically collecting his money. Should have first checked on Roy, who surprises him by not cashing in his chips just yet and ferociously beating him to death with his bare hands. After rescuing Rachel, she drives him to hospital as he steadily bleeds out in the passenger seat. When she emerges from the emergency room with medical assistance, Roy and the car are gone. He has left the bag of money on a wall for her. 
Rachel and her boys relocate to Port Arthur in Texas. One day, with the kids playing on the beach, the mailman arrives at their coastal cabin. Rachel opens a small package, and the St. Christopher she gave to Roy drops out into her hand. Looks like he lived then. Harvey Keitel swaggered onto the scene around the same time that De Niro and Pacino were making their bones in the movies. He had the starring role in Scorsese's first film to make the world sit up and take notice, Mean Streets in 1973, supported by Robert De Niro no less in his breakout role. He's made six films with Scorsese and three with Tarantino. He doesn't have the mannered ticks and grimaces that De Niro has or the tendency towards grandiose demonstrative bluster Pacino so often channels. He's a stiller, broodier, edgier proposition, projecting a human psyche and soul, perceptibly warring internally to keep some slow-acting poison at bay. Often, his characters appear at rest on the surface, whilst there exists an ever-present sense of a repressed latent anger or violence that could explode at any time. He's the sort of actor who keeps an audience on their toes. He can make you hold your breath at just the right moments. Combined with some of the challenging roles he has taken on, Bad Lieutenant, and fingers spring to mind, he can be an uncomfortable watch. Maybe that's why he never quite hit the same level of superstardom enjoyed by his two notable contemporaries. Roy Egan is one of his best screen performances, and he is mesmerizing. Every second he's on screen, he's got your attention. He is the thing you look to focus on. It's a rare talent to be able to do that, especially with a part that doesn't require much dialogue, but relies primarily on the physical, on the visually expressive, on generating in presence. When he eventually gets his revenge, when he beats Skip to death, slowly, methodically, purposefully, he creates a convincing illusion that he is really beating Skip to death. It's strangely exhilarating, cathartic, and frightening all at the same time. Harvey Keitel is a giant. That alone might be reason enough to watch, but naturally, it isn't all you get. Director John Irvin had some decent flicks on his resume by the time he made City of Industry. The unfortunately disappointing screen version of Frederick Forsyth's The Dogs of War, the very underrated old stager spookfest ghost story, and the grueling Vietnam War opus Hamburger Hill. City of Industry is my favourite film of his. With a career background in the restrictive landscape of Brit TV drama, Irvin is more of a robust and unpretentious professional than a trailblazing Hollywood showboater. Looking at today's films, we could do with more of him, storytellers who want to tell a story with precision, care and empathy. Much more preferable to some egocentric puffball who wants to smash a clock in with CGI overload and ham-fisted ideology at the expense of true creativity. In a post tarant world, it was knee-jerk easy to compare it to Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, I suppose, and maybe write it off as an also-ran imitation. But in substance and style, it owes far more to Donald E. Westlake and his stark novels and films like Point Blank or Jim Thompson's hard-boiled pulpers. Irvin has the sun shining down, but the aesthetic is cold, harsh, and chilly. This is Hollywood unglamorous, a sleazy cityscape scabbed by dirt-cheap motels, decaying trailer parks, and pollution belching industry, the ozone of failed dreams hovering like ghosts in the air. His screenwriter, Ken Solars, doesn't go in for Tarantino's lengthy, talky, anecdotal style with the dialogue, preferring to make clipped references to film noir classics with lines like, I'm my own police, which is lifted directly from this gun for hire in 1942. Sometimes, when representing a character's mindset and philosophy, less really is more. The supporting cast excels, Stephen Dorf seemed to find a niche in playing wild-eyed psychos, and Skip is one of the most repellent and irredeemable. As a young Lucy Liu playing one of his ex-girlfriends accurately declares, Skip doesn't have friends, just people he fucks over. To kill Odell's men, he shoots directly through the body of his current dumb but harmless girlfriend Gina, killing them all. That's some nasty guy right there, that is. Famke Jansen is, if anything, too beautiful as Jorge's wife Rachel. Emotionally, she's well on point, but looks too damn good to convince as world-weary and careworn, the jaded feminine vessel of fractured dreams and fading youth. At any given time, she'd light up the cover of Vogue, even when reduced to tears. Her makeup simply doesn't run.
Elliot Gould as a blink and you'll miss him cameo, and both Timothy Hutton and Wade Dominguez pluck the right notes of desperation and the need to succeed this one last time ambition of grassroots criminal types running out of rope and road. Sure, all the characters are close to cliché, but it is Irvin's bravery in dishing them up to us without irony in this post-Tarantino world that succeeds in drawing them as flesh and blood constructs. That and the power of Harvey Keitel as a cinematic image. City of Industry is a haunting hymn of intimate pulp splendour and nihilism, spattered with explosively violent scenes of an authentically upset in nature. Dirty, grimy, bloody, quite unrepentantly nasty in places, it is a soulmate to the peerless Get Carter, the original, of course. Which gives me just one more reason to like it a hell of a lot. Thank you as always for your time and attention. Do whatever you want to do next. Hit like, didn't like, comment, subscribe. Be a patron of my Patreon thing. Make a financial contribution via the thanks button. I will be back as soon as I am. Take care, pilgrims.